From the Jerome L. Green Performance Space at the studios of WQXR, I'm Jeff Spurgeon. So pleased to welcome you to a very special, let's call it a pop-up concert. It's a very special affair with, with a great friend of WQXR and a new friend as well. Our great friend is pianist Leif Ova Ansnes, who happens to be in New York and said he'd stop by, so we invited him to do so. And we have some things to share, too, because he has a brand new album out this Friday, the second of his Mozart Momentum recordings, the second of the two recordings devoted to a specific year, 1786. But we'll talk to Leifova about that in just a moment. And a little bit later in this half hour or so that we'll spend together, we'll also introduce you to one of his good friends and a wonderful musical friend in New York, the soprano Lisa Davidson. But first of all, Leif of Ansnes and Mozart, just for you, from the green space.
Leif of Ansnes in the green space at WQXR. If, if, if I were a dog, I'd, I, my tail would just be wagging, wagging, wagging. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you back in the green space. It's so wonderful that you're here. A little Thank stop you. off in New York uh, because you're in Chicago this weekend playing the Britain concerto with the Chicago Symphony and uh, Ricardo Muti, but we're delighted that you're here today. And this Friday is the release of this second album in the Mozart Momentum Project, mm -hmm. two albums that you've done with the Mahler Chamber Orchestra around particular years of Mozart's life. Um, 1685, sorry, 17. 1785, 1786. What spurred this project and what's so special about those times? Well, <coughs> one could argue that every year of Mozart's life was a momentum year, uh, especially, you know, the last 10, 15 years. But for the piano concerto as a genre, there's something specific happening, I, I think, in 1785, which justifies this, uh, this, this title. With the D minor concerto, number 20, um, he starts separating more the orchestra and the soloist. So the orchestra starts the concerto with very restless music, very dramatic music, very Don Giovanni-like. <laughs> and when the uh, soloist comes in, it's with different music, uh, with a f voice from far away singing, uh, very lonely and that's the first time it happens mm. in a concerto um, and so for Mozart that must have been a very radical thing to do it was very revolutionary and we see that he follows it through in the next concertos and you know for me this is the moment where the you know the romantic piano concerto if you want is born mm. the, the heroic uh, role of the soloist so he he expands the, the storytelling the psychological drama of the whole genre becomes very different at this time okay. so that's 1785 and 1786 so these two years and two albums worth of exploration mm. of this music besides the piano concertos were there uh, there because so there are some other things on the albums are those particularly associated in your mind with this idea of Mozart moving in this new direction as well? Well, he, he moves in, 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 I mean, the piano concerto, there was such a flow in what he was doing in that genre. But at the, at the same time, he's writing, you know, the two first piano quartets that we know, that we have these wonderful uh, uh, pieces, um, this trio, you know, these kind of wonderful pieces. There's um, um, funeral, a Freemason music for, for, for the orchestra which they are doing. So it's, it's to show the diversity of mm. what happened these years. And he was writing uh, Marriage of Figaro in 1786. So the album we are now releasing, I think a lot of the music there is also colored by his operatic thinking mm. and, mm. and feeling at the time. Well, he's making his way in, in Vienna, finding his uh, place in there, 29 and 30 years of age mm. in those in those times. It's just boggling to think yeah. about. Well, Absolutely. congratulations on that. Another successful collaboration with the Mahler Chamber Orchestra. And 1786, the second of the Mozart Momentum albums, is released in the US this Friday, April 8th. Now, to look ahead a little bit at what you're doing, Dvorak has come into your world. Um, pandemic rumb lookings around, is that what sort of inspired? So also looking a little bit back, yes, because it um, a project for me during the pandemic, as, as with a lot of us musicians, we found that we have more time <laughs> to maybe explore things that we otherwise wouldn't have, have time to do. And I'd been thinking for a while about this, this cycle by Dvorak, Poetic Tone Pictures, Opus 85, which is strangely unknown in the world. When did, um, you, when did, you, run a, did you run across I it during the pandemic or had you learned it before? I actually before? played a few pieces when I was a child. Uh, my parents happened to have a recording of this and there are not many recordings of these pieces. Um, but um, so I knew, I knew these pieces from, from quite early on and uh, I thought they were beautiful. And the more and more I've looked at them through the years, I thought, oh, this is actually a really wonderful set of pieces. And then I read a wonderful quote that Dvorak, when he, after he had written these pieces, he, he writes to a friend, I wish somebody would have the courage to play all of them, um, you know, as a cycle. It's one hour, it's th that 13 pieces. Yeah, 13. Hours. So I, um, I got the courage during the <laughs> pandemic <laughs> and I studied them and I've recorded them and there's another recording then coming out in the fall and I'm going to play it a lot in recitals and I'm looking so much forward to that because it's, know, to champion these pieces which people don't know is for me the great forgotten cycle of the 19th century for wow. piano. That's a, that's a big statement, but you have championed pieces like this before, dug around in little corners of the repertoire, so it's a wonderful thing. And you're going to offer us one of those right now. It's the uh, Spring Song. 
Very right? fitting, I think. Right. Oh. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Perfect time of the year. Opus 85, number four of Dvorak, um, from a new uh, exploration by pianist Leif Ova Anslis. A special moment from a work that perhaps you don't know. A set of pieces, 13 of them for the piano by Antonin Dvorak. They've been newly recorded by Leif Ova Ansnes, and he's taking those pieces on the road this fall in a set of recitals that he's going to be doing. It's a very special Monday, the 4th of April, at the Jerome L. Green Performance Space in New York City with Leif Ova Ansnes here with us at WQXR and in a wonderful gesture of kindness to everyone. He brought a friend with him today. She is absolutely the toast of the town in circles these days in the opera world. Soprano Lisa Davidson. She sang Meister Singer earlier in the season, Ariadna Auf Naxos in a recent run, and right now she's in the middle of a long set of performances, a number of performances, um, starring with Nina Stemme in Richard Strauss's Elektra. Just a nice little family story you can enjoy at the Metropolitan Opera these days. And we're so pleased that Leifova has brought Lisa Davidson with him to WQXR today because last year, and maybe just released in the US early this year, a brand new album of songs by Edvard Grieg. Two Norwegian artists celebrating 
their countrymen's great work. Edvard Grieg wrote, what, 180 songs? They managed to squeeze almost 30 of them onto this incredible album, and they brought three of them with them today to sing for you. We're going to hear, um, uh, first of all, a couple of songs from some Grieg explorations of German poetry, Heine settings, um, and then a Norwegian setting from Grieg's only song cycle um, called uh, Haugtusse, The Mountain Maid. So here with three songs by Grieg are Lisa Davidson and Leif Ove Ansnes. Oh, yeah. 
Well, my goodness, what an extraordinary treat to hear songs of Edgar, uh, Edvard Grieg from, from two sympathetic voices, Leif Hova Ansnes at the piano and Lisa Davidson, the soprano, um, songs that they have recorded. But out of 180 songs of Grieg, how, who went through the list? Did you go through the list, Lisa, to pick these out for the album? I guess in all projects like this, it's uh, it's about killer darlings in a way. But uh, they were quite <laughs> clear. I mean, Hauptus uh, was, of course, at least f for me and 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 f for us, I think the, the 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 core piece of this recording. That's that's why I wanted to do it. And then there's some songs that are very very obvious, and then there's other opuses that we discuss back and forth. Some songs like Uva really wanted to do, and some I wanted to do, and some he knew more than I and, and the other way around. And, and through that, we found our way through, through this album. Oh, it's wonderful. And you only have 150 more to record. So we'll look forward <laughs> to the next 18 albums from you um, in, that, in that collection. Leifova pointed out when we were talking earlier, and, and now I heard it, the difference between the way that he writes in the songs that are set in German and then the way that he writes in the music that's set in Norwegian. Now, is that just part of these songs, or is Leif Ove, is that, does that go through everything? I don't know. I, I just find it so striking, and we found it striking, I think, when we did these two opuses um, in concerts in, in, in January, six German songs and then the Hauktusa, because it's such completely different music, and they're both so great. But I think in the German songs, he is, after all, building more on the German tradition of writing uh, songs from Mendelssohn Schumann, and you know he he had his education in Leipzig and, and all that. And when he gets to Hauktusa, which is um, so much about the Norwegian nature and and um, fairy tales in that, um, there's a different kind of it's it's it gets very impressionistic and full of fantasy and and space and. Uh, don't you find, Lisa? It's Absolutely, yeah. and I think you're right. It, you realize it, especially when you put them together next to each other, and, and, and you, you wonder, is it the same composer in a way? But um, that's also the joy of, of doing these albums, where there's so many songs, and, and, and they're all very different, but then some of them fit more together than others. And, and, um, and I think, of course, the language itself is, is, is one of the, the core things in this, that, that he, he writes for the German, and then maybe the German tradition I, I sort of infects him more than, than you realize until mm. then he comes back to Norway, and that's sort of his language in a way. I feel like most uh, Americans and, and maybe generally classical music people know a couple of Greek songs, but they're both from Peer Gint, and I'm sorry to say it that way. I know that hurts every time. <laughs> People say Pierre Gint in that way. Uh, but we know those songs. But I don't think that, that we know the rest of Grieg's enormous song output. Are they known in Norway? Are they known in your country? Depends who you ask. In, in the classical singer's world, of course, they are known, uh, the songs we chose, I guess. But, but no, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely the language, I think, for, for the rest of the world, um, why it's difficult. It's, it's hard to find a Norwegian teacher in New York who can, who can teach you how to pronounce all of this. And then we have these two written languages and a lot of things, and then a Danish. So it's, it's hard to embark on these songs. But I do hope that this album can encourage people to listen more to it and maybe try it out, because there are... There are definitely ways to, to do these songs too and to find uh, how to pronunciate it properly. <laughs> well, it's a wonderful treasury and it's so great that, that you guys got together. And how did you get together for this album? Leif Ove, do you want to tell the story? <laughs> well, uh, do you uh, not want to tell the story? Sort of, Lisa sort of attacked me in, in an airport actually. <laughs> well, attacking is, oh, a bit, is, is a bit strong, but approached me. Uh, and said, do you want to do an album? And I said, immediately, of course, yes. Uh, and this was about four or five years ago. And, uh, and after that, it's been a wonderful journey, too. And the pandemic you know, meant that we two could meet a little bit more than we would otherwise have had time and, and dates to do. So, so we've, it's been a wonderful process with this Greek recording and, and, and to dive into this repertoire together. Well, it's a great, I think it's a great gift you've given the world to share. Uh, these songs from this great composer, and, and especially because they are unknown, they are native to you in so many ways, and so richly done, so thank you. And Lisa, it's such a privilege to meet you. You're having such a moment this year in New York, not the only place that you sing, but oh my God, to be doing Electra with Nina Stemma at the Met on top of 
the amazing notices that you got for Ariadna, and you're back next season, I think, too. I'm back see next season for my first Marshallin in the Der Rosenkavalier. Oh, we're going to look forward to that so much. It's such a privilege to meet you and hear you sing, and I only wish the room were larger because your voice <laughs> could, well, it does. It fills the auditorium at the Metropolitan Opera. It's just so amazing. Thank you so much. And Leifova, it's great to see you here. Congratulations on the new Mozart album. We'll find you in Chicago this weekend playing Britain with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And, uh, and I think you have something else that you'd like to share to close our time here today. Well, um, I just at, at the end, maybe a small encore. I mean, we, we found ourselves also in very dark and restless times. And uh, the reports coming out from Ukraine now is, are just heartbreaking. And um, what can we do as musicians other than just show compassion? And, and, and lately also discovering some Ukrainian music, maybe playing Ukrainian music. And I, uh, I would like to play a, a small piece by, by Silvestrov, this composer that was evacuated. Uh, he's 84 years old, was evacuated from Kiev um, two weeks ago from his home. And um, it's a wonderful little bagatelle uh, that I would like to share. Wonderful. Leif over Arnsness and a touch of the music of Valentin Silvestrov.
a moment of the music of Valentin Silvestrov. The music helps us to feel the emotions that are around us, and they give those emotions expression in a language that lies beyond words. And the music doesn't fix anything, but it can help fix us, and then we can go and be our better selves. An encore offered by Lefova Ansnes, composed by Valentin Silvestrov, as Lefova said, evacuated just a couple of weeks ago from Kiev. And with that, well, we thank our incredible artists, Lefova Ansnes and Lisa Davidson. Lisa has five more appearances in Electra at the Met, including a Saturday afternoon broadcast you'll hear on WQXR. Lefova is in Chicago this coming weekend to play the Britain Concerto with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Um, Lisa and Leifova's album of Grieg songs is already out in the world, and Leifova's new Mozart Momentum 1786 recording is officially released in the United States this Friday. With thanks to you for viewing, oh, and thanks to Steinway and Sons for the Spirio Piano. He makes it sound really good, doesn't he? Thank you so much for watching. I'm Jeff Spurgeon from WQXR and the Jerome L. Green Performance Space. Thank you for watching and listening.